I'm going to present uh, yet another executor, um, <laughs> which uh, has been developed in the MicroRoS project. Um, and therefore, I just uh, will give you some overview about uh, MicroRoS. So why MicroRoS? So as, as, as you have heard right now, and otherwise you wouldn't be here, ROS is a dominant framework for, uh, for robotics application, but mainly for powerful devices like, like Linux running on Raspberry Pis. It has lots of advantages, lots of tools of quality of service and also for security. But for microcontrollers, it has uh, just a too large memory footprint. And as we have heard also, uh, it is not real-time safe, non-deterministic executor behavior. And typically in uh, embedded uh, applications, you have non-functional requirements like real-time uh, requirements for end-to-end -end latencies. And there have been, of course, approaches for integrating microcontrollers into your robotics framework. And for, especially for ROS1, that was uh, ROS Serial with limited features, but also now also MROS, which targets a little bit larger um, microcontrollers up, let's say, 10 megabytes of RAM. Therefore, uh, now four years ago, uh, European projects started um, MicroROS, which puts uh, ROS2 on microcontrollers with just uh, 100 kilobytes of RAM, really resource constrained. And because of that, uh, we decided not to go for an um, C++ API as the user would expect to use um, SDL containers with dynamically allocated memory. And uh, it provides, uh, therefore, um, a C client library with all, uh, which is feature complete uh, for a ROS2 API, and which makes the integration of microcontrollers into a ROS2 ecosystem much more, uh, much more easier. Um, here's an overview uh, sl um, a slide of, of the stack on the right side. So um, the microROS um, um, stack or let's say the the, um, um, the the goal how to uh, implement something on the resource constrained uh, microcontroller is to offload some parts uh, on a Rust so to call it Rust two agent which runs on a normal processor and then the communication between the microcontroller and the uh, normal system is done by a uh, is um, a standard called Extremely Resource Constrained Environment, DDS. And then this um, um, implementation then is run on a, a real-time operating systems like Zephyr, FreeRTOS, and, and NATEX. And on top of it runs the, the ARMW and the default RCL there. And we have implemented on that con a couple of convenience functions and the so-called RCLC executor. Okay. And uh, now, as we have seen in the previous um, talks in this workshop, we're focusing more deeply on the implementation of ROS2. I would like to uh, focus more on the uh, application level and think about what are typical uh, patterns in robotics that, that um, have been led to meet real-time requirements. So the most and let's say most general uh, structure or most general software pattern you will find is a sense plan act control loop where you have a phased execution of different um, parts. And um, uh, essentially you want that um, all the sensor acquisition is finished before you start your localization or planning phase. And currently it's not possible to synchronize uh, these um, these uh, callbacks and also as mentioned before, um, and therefore we need something uh, a mechanism. We would like to have a mechanism to to face execution ex uh, the execution of of certain uh, callbacks. The second thing uh, which uh, which is a problem in robotics is sensor fusion with multiple rates. So on the right side you see uh, two sensors, uh, let's say a laser uh, with uh, ten hertz and then inertial measurement unit, uh, IMU with 500 Hertz, and you would like to uh, send, uh, fuse those data. And um, one way is of course to reduce the rate. And then whenever you have um, um, a sample at a rate was 10 Hertz from the IMU and from the laser, then you will uh, proceed. But you could also do it in a very different way from an application point of view. You could say, you know, I, I wait, whenever in you, you can let your application drive 
by the laser. So basically, whenever um, a laser uh, scan comes in, then I will request um, the all, all IMU messages that are available, and then I do the processing. So that kind of gives you a feeling that um, in order to implement this kind of uh, logic, which is from a sensor fusion point of view, um, much easier and cleaner way of a software architecture, I need new concepts in, in ROS2. A third one is, um, as in the, in the previous talk, uh, I would like to have a way to have a predefined order of callback processing or you know, a way to prioritize a certain path, for example, obstacle avoidance or sense plan, sense phase, and then the obstacle avoidance algorithm, and then only later on uh, run the, the plan and the act phase. So we have been looking at very different uh, use cases and software patterns and try to figure out what would be the minimal features that we need to implement in an RCLC or in, in an executor to implement all this kind of stuff. So we came up with two basic concepts. The first concept is that we want to have a user-defined order of callback processing. That is here on the right side when you have callbacks, and this is now an example just for subscriptions, but of course this is, uh, has been implemented for timers, services, clients, um, and so on. Um, in, in this particular order, first callback B, then A, and then C, and then if let's say three messages are available, then the all uh, these callbacks will always be executed in this particular order. And something, and this is the first concept, and the second concept is um, a trigger condition, which is uh, um, which which can be used to synchronize between messages. And that means when three messages are available, I can define trigger condition like end or one particular or advanced, and then the execution um, advances with the predefined order of callback processing. Want to go into this into more detail? I'll just give an example. So for um, so assume I have these three callbacks and they shall be processed in the order B, A, and C. And uh, one particular subscription has new data that would mean um, the, the processing of uh, this entire chain will start if one particular message is available and uh, irrespective if messages of A or C are available. And this of course assumes that your callback can also handle a null point or basically can be called uh, on, on, on empty data. Or, or, um, or not, you can specify this later. The second way is to say, uh, I will start processing if all messages are available. Or the uh, third one is the default RCLCPP default executor behavior. That is when any message, um, when any subscription has new data, I will uh, start processing in this, this uh, case, for example, just processing that particular message, that particular callback where the, the message is available. And uh, furthermore, you can also have a user-defined trigger with more co complex logic, complex logic. And now given for this, um, uh, for this example, we also uh, there's a, there's a fusion node here, this point cloud fusion, where you can see here two input um, two, two input messages. So the fusion node has two inputs, and it shall be um, executed if both inputs are available. So let's look into the source code of this point fusion point cloud fusion node, and what you can see here is that in the source code you have um, a condition basically checking um, if the data has been cached in um, I mean, locally. And this has been done here before. So whenever the callback is called, it takes the message, puts it into an internal cache. And then here it checks basically the activation um, condition of this entire node um, if you want to proceed. So what's the problem with this? So first of all, you have hard-coded the activation semantics in the application. And secondly, um, you will shadow the DDS quality of service parameters. In this case, you have only maybe one message you want to cache. But uh, imagine, let's say you have 10 messages from one subscription and one message from another subscription. And then you would have, you would need in your local um, 
callback, a queue of 10 elements, and that was basically shadow uh, your quality of service parameters that you rely on. And if uh, you look into the future, that let's say edge uh, cloud computing um, becomes more and more important where um, you want to realize real-time communication over quality of service. And the user doesn't have any direct means to express uh, the activation semantics and the developers will always try to do it somehow and then you will end up with something like in, in, in the source code, which is very difficult then to analyze later on. So what, what is the, the benefit when you have a trigger condition? So when you have a trigger condition in an executor, then you can, you can set it um, by, for example, this default executor here, it's called RCLC executor all, which means an end condition. Of all input, pump, uh, of all input callbacks, and then in the source code you will see no uh, glue code. Basically, this callback is only called when this trigger condition is true. So, what are the benefits? You have an explicit activation semantics. There is no guarding glue code in the application, and you maintain the uh, DDS quality of service parameters. Um, we have implemented this uh, for, for the reference system on a Raspberry Pi. Uh, this is a, a work in progress. Um, and um, basically, we see that the performance is uh, a little bit uh, better than the single threaded executor, but, but roughly uh, we, don't, we don't expect any uh, you know, improvements for, for uh, performance here. It's more about the deterministic behavior and how you, how you specify it. So that, that would, would be my, my, my main point for the executor. But last but not least, I would like to um, uh, mention that the RCLC executor has also a way to express real-time scheduling. And um, the way um, um, we have looked at this is that we have one, um, I mean, we have a direct uh, API that allows us to um, assign the scheduling policy for example, the priority for every subscription, as seen in the previous talk. Uh, but here, a little bit more general that we can assign the uh, SCAD param, which is the scheduling parameter of the underlying operating system, to the subscription. And then there is a dedicated uh, executor thread, which will do the interface between uh, the middleware. And whenever a new message becomes available, it will be handed over to the worker thread for every subscription. And by this, basically, you can uh, assign and, and every thread represents um, the, the oh, so in every thread, um, and there's then one callback function for, for, the, um, for the corresponding message. And then the scheduling uh, policies will be assigned to, this, um, to these threads. Um, and we have uh, uh, published um, a paper on uh, Axif where we are applying this to a budget-based scheduling. And in one of the previous talks, I think it was a callback group level, somebody asked about SCAD sched deadline. So this is ex uh, similar. So SCAD deadline is a reservation-based scheduling approach where you can define the budget in a particular period. And NatX um, operate a real-time operating system implements this. And the, the really benefit of reservation-based scheduling is when you have you have a composable system. And when you add a new function to your system, and which is re rely which relies on priorities, you have to give this new function a priority, which will change basically the, the real-time guarantees of your existing, existing system. But with a budget-based approach. Your, your previous system um, stays intact. Um, as a conclusion, um, we have, um, I mean, in, 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 embedded, in embedded scope, you have lots of safety critical applications which require real-time and deterministic behavior. And we have analyzed typical robotic software patterns which can be implemented by the uh, RCLC executor, namely by user-defined execution order a trigger condition and enabling the real-time operating uh, enabling the real-time scheduling as a ROS2 API. And the benefits of these features are a separation of concerns 
that you have the activation semantics um, explicit and not in the application code, um, provides you deterministic behavior and also real-time guarantees of end-to-end -end latencies. And as a bottom line of this presentation is that um, we'd like to have, let's say, a ROS2 executor with a trigger condition that would greatly support the development of deterministic ROS2 applications. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ralf. Uh, sorry, Jan. <laughs> um, oh, so I have a question. Um, I, as, as far as I understood, I could use the RCC executor also with uh, the normal ROS2. I don't um, need a, a micro ROS. Um, would it yes. then make sense to, to have an, an API, a C++ API on top of it? And would this be uh, like a completely new API? or? Yeah, so indeed, there had been a discussion and um, a ticket is open to have a C++ API on top of RCLC. Um, that would be um, a thin layer on top, um, which uh, which and which basically has to deal with the type type support and um, about uh, some some limitations about the the callback signatures. Um, definitely possible. So there are some. Uh, I put my co the concepts um, in in that that issue. However, uh, uh, another thing needs to be considered, and that is uh, typically when uh, developers, right? The question is, can I use my SLAM algorithm on MicroRoss, right? And, but typically then the application uses dynamic um, uh, memory allocation and which will lead to memory fragmentation. So that basically gives you um, maybe a false impression that you can use full-fledged C++ code on your microcontroller. So technically, I think it's possible to have a thin layer on, on top of RCLC uh, to run it on microcontroller. But the user has to know what he's doing. 